All right. So let's go ahead and dive on into some, uh, some tips and tricks about uh, schema design do's and don'ts and the impact that those can have on the performance of your writes and your queries. So by the end of this webinar, uh, participants will be able to describe the influx data model. We're going to understand the trade-offs involved in storing data as a tag or as a field, which are distinct ideas in the InfluxDB model. We're going to apply, uh, learn what best practices there are for designing schemas, uh, understand some of the hardware requirements for particular use cases, and learn how to make informed decisions about the performance trade-offs when thinking about our own schema designs. So first, let's talk a little bit about the InfluxDB data model. Here is a typical time series graph. This is an imaginary graph of uh, some stock market data. And it has the canonical time series uh, property in that we see that time is one of the axes along, uh, al along the graph. So what, what components do we have in this graph and what do they relate to in an InfluxDB schema? So the title of the graph is the stock price. This would be roughly analogous to the measurement name in uh, in InfluxDB. Measurements are logical containers of related points. Uh, and this graph is a logical container of related graphs. Now we have the tags. So the legend uh, here for the, for the graph is going to be metadata about the measurements that we've taken. And metadata in InfluxDB is typically stored as a tag. So we have things like the ticker and the market. Uh, which are properties that don't change with every measurement, but are constant along one particular series, one particular measurement line. Uh, and tags in InfluxDB are indexed. They are highly performant to query against, um, and they are uh, they are things we can use in group by clauses and, and other places where we require there to be an index. And we call the full group of tags, both the tag key and the tag value, and all the tag key and tag value pairs, we call this the tag set. So the tag set for the first one there is ticker equals A, market equals NASDAQ. The tag set for the second one is ticker equals AA, market equals NYSE. So when we talk about the tag set, we're talking about not just the, the tag keys, not just the tag values. We're talking about the full combination of the key value pairs. And that is what is indexed. We then have the actual metric at each point. Uh, and these are the fields, the price. This is the thing, the value that's changing over time as we measure it. Um, so the, the property that's changing over time, the thing that's actually being measured is a field generally in InfluxDB. And fields can be float, floating points, they can be integers, they can be strings, or they can be a Boolean. Fields are not indexed. Uh, so typically the property measured is stored as a field and information about the property being measured is stored as a tag, as we said. So your data is a field, your metadata is a tag. And it, similarly to the fields or to the tag set, we call the key value pairs of all the fields, the field set. Uh, here we have price equals 177.03, price equals 32.10. So these are obviously all equaling floats. Uh, in this particular example, we have only one field per point, uh, but there can be many. There's no restriction on how many fields that you have per point. So you can store multiple fields. And then we have the timestamp. And as you can see from this very long timestamp example on the graph, excuse me, in InfluxDB, timestamps are stored by default in nanoseconds since epoch. And how do we represent this data textually when we're submitting it to the system? Uh, we have a, a proprietary, or not a proprietary, but we have a uh, our own write protocol called the line protocol, which is as follows. It's the measurement, comma, the full tag set, and each key value pair in the tag set is separated by commas. Then we have white space and the full field set, and again, each key value pair is separated by a comma. Then some white space and the optional timestamp. If you don't supply a timestamp when writing to the database, the database will use its own local server time as the current timestamp. And so here we can see stock price is the measurement. Then we have a comma to separate it from the tag set. The tag set is ticker equals A, comma, market equals NASDAQ. So we have two tags set. Uh, then we have some white space and we have the full field set, which in this case is just price equals 177.03. Then we have more white space and the explicit timestamp that we're providing here in nanoseconds since epoch. Actually, that might not quite be nanoseconds. Uh, so points in influx 
they look like this. Here's a representation now in line protocol of each of the points that we've been discussing earlier. Uh, so the blue point there, the blue circle at the top is stock price uh, is the measurement. Ticker equals A, market equals NASDAQ, price equals 177.03, and it has that timestamp. And with the exact same timestamps, we have two other points that have different values for price, uh, different values for ticker, different and potentially different values for the market. We can see that we have two on the NASDAQ and one on the New York Stock Exchange. So when we talk about a series in InfluxDB, we're talking about a particular line on the graph, right? So a particular combination of measurement and the full tag set. That defines the series. The measurement plus the tag set defines the series. And the measurement plus the tag set plus the timestamp defines the single point on that series. And we're leaving aside a bit here the concept of retention policies, but if you want to learn more about that, there's the uh, continuous queries and retention policies webinar that we offer and also is available on the webinars uh, on the, the website. So the important things to remember as we go through the rest of the exercises today, tags are indexed. They are performant in searches. Fields are not indexed. They are not as performant when used in a where clause. And every point is indexed by time. Time is the primary index in the system. And in fact, the entire storage system is built around the time index. So schema design, um, we're going to start by talking about what not to do. There are many, many different use cases. Uh, so we're going to talk about some of the things that are commonly bad instead of the things that are universally good, because there aren't as many universally good things. So the first one to know is, unlike a graphite style measurement uh, storage system, in InfluxDB, it is not a good idea to encode data into the measurement name, whether that's data about the metric or whether it's metadata about the sensor or the device or whatever the customer, whatever that might be. These are better put in as fields and tags. If you store it in the measurement name, it's going to significantly restrict your ability to query that, later, that data later. So here we see some examples of very graphite style DevOps data, cpu.server-5.us west and value equals two, uh, and then the timestamp. Um, and another example was you know, some memory or, or a different server. And Instead, in InfluxDB, the way that we would prefer to encode that information is to use the, the CPU or the mem free as the measurement. That's the actual thing that we're looking at that we're measuring right now. Uh, and to have host equals server five, region equals US West. So we're storing that metadata as tags now. And that means that we can use it in group by clauses. We can use it more readily in the where clause. Uh, we won't have to use regular expressions in our where clause, which definitely slow things down. Um, if you can use equality operators or negation operators as opposed to regular expressions, the query is much faster. Uh, and in fact, it would also be possible to, and I don't believe we have it on this slide, but it would be possible to store all of these um, together. We could store multiple fields in the field set and we could have CPU load equals two, mem free equals 2,500 as two fields on the same point for server six, or I guess it would be value, uh, the CPU would be four, for server six region US West. Okay, what are some other things? So what if my plugin sends data like that to InfluxDB? The Graphite protocol has been around for a while, and it's a very popular way to output uh, for many systems and for many monitoring tools. So we have a solution for that built into the system. There is a, an, you can either write something that sits between the source uh, of the information in FlexDB, or we have plugins in the database itself, which are endpoints that you can access and send to them graphite style metrics, which are then parsed using a template set up in the InfluxDB configuration file, which translates that graphite dotted metric style into a key value tag and field set style. So we can see an example of this here, uh, where we have sensu.metric.net.server.ethernet0. Uh, transmitted or received packets, uh, we can use the the sort of wildcard and um, an explicit uh, column matching filter that we have below. There's a template which filters out the sensu metric part. Says, you know what, we don't need to keep that. We know it's a sensu metric. And then you're going to find the measurement name, and then the next thing is going to be the host, and then the interface, and then the field name. And so we then see that translated into the measurement becomes net, the host equals server zero, the interface equals ethernet zero, uh, and the field name is transmitted or received uh, bytes or packets. Uh, 
Uh, so there's a way to easily translate these uh, long dotted measurement names or whatever your separator character might be into the key value pair tag set and field set for InfluxDB uh, simply by setting up the proper filters in the configuration file. So what is another bad practice? Uh, so don't overload tags. So again, here we see an example where we've set the server equals localhost.us west or localhost.us east. So that's two different pieces of information that we've encoded into a single tag. Server is the tag name or the tag key, I should say. Uh, but we have two pieces of metadata there. We have both that the server name is localhost and that it is located in the US west or the US east region. And instead, it's better to separate those out into two different tags where host equals localhost and region equals US west. We're being more specific. So the tags are more descriptive of their properties. Uh, and we're avoiding having to do something like use a regular expression to match against localhost in any region or match against US East with any host name, um, which we would have to do if we were using a single tag server equals localhost.us East or US West. We'd need to use regular expressions to separate that out. And again, regular expressions uh, are not as performant. And as the old adage goes, if you have a problem and you decide to solve it with regular expressions, now you have two problems. So if we can avoid using them in our queries, our queries will be more performant, uh, more readable, more repeatable, uh, and easier to use with graphing tools like Chronograph and Grafana. So remember to keep your metadata in separate tags if possible. Don't use tags that have a high variability. Um, so for example, UUIDs or hashes, random strings, um, storing the full refer URL, for instance, can be a problem. Um, just something where you have an unbounded set of possible tag values. And the reason is uh, that there's a, a, a challenge in the system where the more series you have, a series are defined by the unique, uh, again, a series is defined by the measurement plus a tag set. So if you have an unbounded tag value, you have an unbounded number of values or number of possible tag sets. And as that number grows, the RAM needs of the system will grow. We'll talk a little bit more about what that really means later but understand that one of the primary ways that people can get their InfluxDB system into a, a very resource intensive state is by having a tag that has an unbounded value. So for example, here we have response time is the measurement that we're, we're tracking. And we have session ID and request ID, which look like some sort of UUID. They're probably going to be unbounded. There's certainly going to be a lot of values. Uh, so what can we do here? Well. One thing is we can store those as fields potentially, but perhaps there's a reason we need them to be tags. Um, so there's a couple of ways around that in order to bring the cardinality down, uh, the number of series that you have, the cardinality. One is to vertically shard across instances. So you can run multiple InfluxDB instances completely independently of each other and store chunks of data in here. The sort of canonical use case in this, in, in this example is customer data, which you're, you can shard then by alphabetically by email address or by last name or something along those lines uh, because your your querying system would know oh I'm retrieving a customer with email that begins with F I need to go to this system to retrieve that and it wouldn't be likely that you're retrieving multiple pieces of customer data across multiple customers so needing to query uh, the customers together is, is not as is not as common um, there are other ways to do it as well you can use some prefix tag groupings so let's say you wanted to store latitude and longitude as tags Obviously, a full lat long is a very uh, long and unique number uh, often. And if you have any number of users scattered around the globe, then you could very easily end up with a very high number of latitude and longitude values. But let's say that really all you need to do is group by region, say down to uh, a few hundred square miles or maybe even a little bit more than that. You can use just the, uh, the degrees of the latitude and longitude as tags in order to quickly find people located in the same place or to quickly find data points or sensors located in the same basic region. And then the full uh, minutes and seconds could also be stored as fields. And therefore you would have that data in order to get more precise about the location, but you would have the coarse or the rough data that you could group by and do some sort of uh, high level location mapping without causing your cardinality to be too high. Again, if you're only storing the degrees and you have 360 possible values for the latitude and 360 for the longitude, that's not an egregious number of series. Um, even multiplying those two together, it's still only going to be a few hundred thousand series. And that's, that's a completely manageable number. Uh, the other solution is that you can use clustering to horizontally shard series across multiple data nodes. Uh, 
So uh, we do have a commercial clustering offering. Um, and it is not part of the open source product. The, in commercial clustering, each data node would only need to handle the series local to it. If you had, say, seven data nodes and you were replicating your data twice in, within the cluster, so there were two copies of every piece of data, then that means that you could have uh, seven over two more series in that system before you ran into problems. Because each data node only has to handle uh, really you know, two-sevenths of the total number of series within the system. So independent tags have a cost. As we talked about, uh, series cardinality, the more independent, the more tag values we have, the more actual number of series we have, the more unique tag sets we have, the more RAM we're going to need. So in the example here, we're storing uh, a lot of data about when the measurement was taken. Let's say we want to we do things later, like know what hour of the day uh, our CPUs are typically the most uh, overloaded. So we're storing that it's the 10th week of the year, that it's a Tuesday is the weekday, uh, it's the 14th hour, 34th minute, et cetera, et cetera. That's a lot of independent tags. Each of those can be is unrelated to the others, and we can have obviously a huge number of, of multiplicative values when we combine all of them there together. How many minutes are there in a year? That's how many series we could potentially have here. Um, so instead, we can store those as fields, and we can still use them in queries uh, and filter by them. Um, and we can retrieve that data and uh, buy those values, and we can do things post-processing on the client side if we need to group it. But we can keep our cardinality down by storing those as, as fields. So as we can see here, we just kept the host tag, and we moved all the other things, the value, the week, uh, the weekday, the hour, the minute, to fields uh, to reduce the cardinality. Now, actually, before I move on, to point out here, independent tags have a cost. Dependent tags do not have a cost. So uh, one of the examples we often use here is if I'm storing customer data and I have an email address in my system as a tag, that is already a unique identifier for that customer. And if I were to then add things like first name, last name, and street address to that customer record as tags, I'm not increasing my overall number of series. I'm certainly making the series more detailed. The tag set has gotten larger, but it has not gotten more numerous because I'm not going to have the same email address with multiple first names and multiple last names and multiple street addresses. One email address, one first name, one last name, one street address because they are dependent tags. The email address implies the first and last name and the street address. So independent tags have a cost. Dependent tags have a minor cost in that the full tag set is stored in RAM as part of the index. Uh, so as you add more tags, even if they are dependent, you're simply adding more bytes to the index. But it is a, a second or third order effect to worry about something like that. For your primary performance concerns, make sure that you have uh, the number of tags that you need and anything that doesn't need to be a tag could probably and should probably be a field in order to keep your memory needs down. Uh, don't use the same name for a field and a tag. Uh, in almost every database on the planet, it's a bad idea to mix your identifiers, uh, and that's true for InfluxDB as well. It significantly complicates your queries. So if we see here, we have the login measurement, user type equals admin, and user ID equals 2342, uh, and they have a successful login, right? So great. But we're storing user equals admin as a tag. We're storing user equals 2342 as a field. In order to query those, we have to then use this double uh, colon notation to say, give me back the user that is a field. Give me back the user that is a tag. Uh, that is obviously not the easiest syntax to work with necessarily. Um, and actually, in older versions of the database, it wasn't even possible to do so. It would always assume that you were referring to the field, and the tag could never be retrieved. So instead, differentiate those pieces of uh, those identifiers somehow. So on the bottom, we see that we've explicitly said the type, the uh, tag is the user type, and the field is the user ID. And now they are separate entities and can be more trivially queried separately. Um, don't use too few tags. So I spent a long time telling you to have a minimal tag set, but the queries that you want to run will tell you what should probably be a field and what should probably be a tag. So uh, the first example here is to show that if we had points set up like this, where we have CPU is the measurement, the region equals US West is our entire tag set, and then we're storing the host name as a field, what the one of the problems that we have here is that actually those last two points in the example here, where host equals server one, host equals server two, they have the same timestamp. And if we recall, the series is defined by the, the measurement and the tag set, not the field set, uh, 
and the individual point is identified by the timestamp. So what we have here is two copies of the same point. So we are not actually going to store two individual points with those three rights above. We will store two points, or excuse me, we'll store three points with those rights above. We'll store two points, and one of them will have region equals US West, host equals server one, host equals server two, value equals four, value equals one, all at the same timestamp. When they're written together, the last one to writes, actually uh, the current behavior is no longer last write wins. The current behavior is that the system will store the union of the field sets with any conflicts going to the most recently written point. Um, so actually it would be host equals server one, host equals server two, value equals one would be what would end up getting stored with those writes. As we mentioned earlier, fields are not indexed, which means that if you used host in the where clause, it would be less performant. The system has to actually scan every point that matches the measurement and tag set and pull those from disk to evaluate the field set. It does not know what the fields are until it reads them. Uh, and you cannot use fields in a group by. So with the with a schema set up by this these rights, this line protocol that we're submitting, we would not be able to group by host. Um, so that would be a limitation that probably is not what we want. One other thing to be aware of is your precision of the timestamps. Uh, now, as we said, the system defaults to nanosecond precision, which is probably not what most people need. Um, and it's a good idea to use the, the most coarse precision or the least precise precision that you can. Um, because it will, and actually I'm sort of looking at the bottom of the slide now, uh, but when you're writing data with nanosecond precision, but you're actually storing say second timestamps, so seconds since epoch, you're sending an extra nine characters over the wire for all those zeros that come at the end of it. Um, it will slow the write throughput down a little bit, and it will cause uh, larger use on disk. So if you can submit timestamps at one second resolution, one second, you know, seconds since epoch, that will use uh, significantly less disk, like noticeably, measurably less disk. Um, it will be less, uh, fewer bytes going over the wire, and it will be slightly faster to write uh, because the system won't have to resolve as many uh, timestamps and 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 uh, relationships between timestamps. So. When writing with not non nanosecond timestamp, you need to be very explicit that you provide the precision parameter when you're writing. And there's more about this uh, in in, the, in our documentation and on the website. You can read about how to use the precision uh, query string parameter. If you don't, let's say that you submit um, data using the seconds precision and you really need millisecond precision. Well, you might have multiple measurements in the same second that are different milliseconds, you've now lost that. You've now lost the, the granularity to separate your points, um, and the data will be lost or it will be merged together into points that are difficult to separate. Uh, if you write a second timestamp at millisecond precision, then the database is going to think that's just a few milliseconds after January 1st, 1970. If you write a millisecond precision timestamp and the database thinks it's a second precision timestamp, then you're going to end up with a timestamp out in 2185 or something like that. So these are commonly problems that we see when people are initially beginning to write to the database. Um, if your data is showing up with odd timestamps or if it's showing up in the future, then examine whether or not you're using the precision parameter correctly on your writes. And the takeaway again is uh, use the least precise precision that accomplishes your goals. That will give you the best compression on disk and the fastest throughput for your writes. So what are things that you should do with your InfluxDB schema? And again, uh, every use case is slightly different. There are some sort of broad categories together. Uh, and so let's talk about what some of those broad things that are generally good. So you want to start, and we start with our, when we do a professional services schema uh, consult, where we do an engagement with a customer to help them design their schema. The first thing we start with are what are the queries you want to run against your data? That determines by and large what your schema should look like to begin with. And then after we take that initial schema out for a test drive, we can do some performance tweaks if need be. So here we have a query, select count n from stuff, where m is greater than 100, and y matches the regular expression, any of the odd numbers, and group by x. So we have a variety of columns here. We have n, m, y, and x, uh, and we have a measurement called stuff. So knowing that we want to run a query like this, and this is obviously something of an arbitrary example, but knowing that we want to run a query like this, how should we set up our data? So the first one we need to know is that functions only accept fields. So you cannot pass a tag value to a function. There are no functions that will accept tags. Uh, 
uh, and that is not a short term change. The system will operate like that for some time still. Uh, so since we want to take the count of n, we're running the count function against the column n, we know that n has to be stored as a field. There's no other way to do that. We will not be able to run this query unless n is a field. So that's one column down. Where m is greater than 100. So since we're using the greater than operator here with, uh, with the column m, it must be a number. And since it must be a number, we know that it has to be a field. All tag keys, all tag values are stored as strings, and that is all they can be. So if you need to store something as an integer, a floating point, a Boolean, or then they must be stored as, as a field. Fields can also be strings. Uh, but since we're using a, a mathematical comparison operator here, we know that M is also a field. And here we're looking at one of our other conditions in the WHERE clause where Y matches a regular expression. And since we're using the regular expression matching operator with Y, we know that Y must be a tag. Regular expressions are not valid against fields. You can only use direct equality or inequality or comparison operators, but not matching operators. Uh, and the basic reason for this is that, as we discussed before, tags are indexed, fields are not. If you used a regular expression against a field, we'd have to evaluate every field against that regular expression rather than evaluating the index against the regular expression. Um, so it could lead to significant performance challenges. Uh, so in this case, we know that Y must be a tag. So that's three of our four columns. We've determined what they must be based simply on the query we want to run. And then we want to group by the, the column X. So we want our results to come back by grouped by X. Since we're using X in a group by clause, again, we know that X must be a tag. Fields are not valid for the group by clause for a similar reason. Fields are not indexed. The group by clause uh, needs to be able to build the buckets from the index. So that was one query that we knew we wanted to run. It allowed us to determine what all of our fields uh, and tags should be. Um, so again, some general things to keep in mind. What did we talk about here? Anything in a group by clause has to be a tag. If you want to use that column, that value in a group by clause, you must store it as a tag. This does often lead to some tension. Uh, if you have things like user IDs or emails that you want to maybe group by um, and you want to store them as a tag, and again, that can lead to a high series cardinality. There are ways to mitigate that if that's a necessary use case. If you can find a way to run your queries without using that group by and you can store that high cardinality tag as a field instead, then I think that's probably a better way to proceed forward with the system. Um, we will be later this year removing the cardinality or much of the cardinality concerns. The, the entire index will not need to live in RAM anymore, uh, but still a high cardinality series will be, or a, a system with high cardinality of series will have uh, will will be less performant with queries. Uh, the more series that are out there, the larger the index is, the slower queries get. It's not a huge effect, but it is definitely real. So anything in a group by clause must be a tag. Anything that you want to pass to a function, no matter what the function is, even if it's distinct, even if it's count, you must store that that value as a field. Only fields are valid for functions. Tags cannot be passed to functions. If you lose information by storing something as a string, use a field. So if it's very important that you know that this is a number or that you know that this is a Boolean, then you must store it as a field. If you store it as a tag, it will store the characters, but they will no longer be a number. They will simply be the string 2.4. Uh, you will not be able to use them in mathematical expressions or evaluate them in other ways. So if the data has to be a number, if the data has to remain a Boolean, you must store it as a field. Um, and then we talked a little bit about measurements. We didn't really talk about databases too much. Databases and measurements are simply logical containers within the system. User permissions can be set on a database level um, and field sets are scoped to a measurement. So every point within a measurement could potentially have the same field set. Um, so there are reasons why you might choose to have many or few measurements or databases. And in general, having dozens of databases um, with dozens of measurements each is basically fine. You should be OK on a reasonable system. Um, if you find yourself having hundreds of measurements on a database, that's fine. If you find yourself having hundreds of databases, that's interesting. Uh, one of the limitations uh, or consequences, I should say, of that is that every database that you have in the system uh, generates its own file system path for storing the data. 
So when you have hundreds of databases, you now have hundreds of individual file paths under the InfluxDB data directory, and you're storing hundreds of individual shards. Um, so if I had 100 databases with one point each, that's still going to be 100 different shard files uh, versus uh, one database with 100 points in it would be simply one shard file. Now, modern operating systems have no problem with thousands or even tens of thousands of files in a single directory. Uh, but that said, proliferating databases just because you can probably not a great idea because of the file system impacts. So thousands of measurements per database or thousands of databases in a system, not necessarily going to break, but it definitely feels like a non-conformant schema. Um, and it seems like perhaps you've made some choices that are not in line with the InfluxDB data model. Um, that said, there could be reasons to do this. If you're storing all of your customer data in an individual database by customer, uh, that's going to lead to a huge duplication of indices and tag sets and a lot of files on disk, but it would make it trivial to drop all of that customer's data, for instance. Drop database is far more performant than drop measurement. And it could be that there's a reason in your use case where you have highly ephemeral users that that makes sense. Um, so there are, there are times when, and this is why we say there are no hard and fast answers for what you can or should or should not do. Um, but in general, if you find yourself getting more than a few than than a hundred or so measurements or databases, uh, perhaps drop a line to the mailing list or reach out to our professional services team to say, uh, "Am I doing this right?" So now that we've talked about some general do's and don'ts, and we've talked about the kind of flow chart for decision making as to what type of uh, field or tag should my column be, let's do a quick exercise now. So let's say we have ten thousand sensors and they are distributed around the city and they measure air quality at different points throughout the city and they're emitting data every 10 seconds and here are the pieces of data that they are emitting every 10 seconds so the zip code of the sensor location the name of the city where the, the sensor is the latitude and the longitude of the sensor a uuid for that sensor device and they're measuring the smog level, the parts per million CO2, the atmospheric lead, and the sulfur dioxide. So these are the these are the things that we're getting from each sensor every 10 seconds. And now let's talk about how we want to probably organize these into a schema that makes sense and will be performant. So first question, why would it be a bad idea to make latitude or longitude a tag instead of a field? And of course, we talked about this a little bit earlier. Latitude and longitude both have a very high cardinality and would result in a large number of series, unless all of our sensors were in a very tight uh, geospatial area. Uh, in addition, and additionally, we probably care about the numeric properties of latitude and longitude. We might very well want to be subtracting latitude and longitude or saying latitude or longitude greater than or less than some other value in order to scope our queries. So for both of these reasons, uh, latitude and longitude probably should be a field. If we stored them as a tag, we'd have a very high cardinality of tags. We'd have a large number of series. Our RAM needs would be very high. If we store them as a tag, we're storing them as strings. We can no longer do math against them. We can no longer use comparison operators on them. So as we discussed earlier, latitude and longitude probably should be stored as fields. Um, OK. So here are some of the queries that we want to be able to run against our system and again as we said before when you're designing your schema your queries should be the driving factor what do you want to ask the system about so we want to say things like give me the median lead uh, for the last day grouped by the city where the measurement was taken um, or give me the mean carbon dioxide uh, in the last day for san francisco uh, and tell me about it by each device id Give me the smog level uh, from New York City by zip code, uh, and give me the minimum sulfur dioxide level in New York City by zip code again. So what do these queries that we want to run tell us about the schema that we need to have? How can we organize our data to support those queries? So here is one possible uh, schema. And let's go back and look here again. So we have. Lead, CO2, PPM, smog level, SO2 level are all being passed to functions. What does that tell us? That tells us those must be fields. And we have city, device ID, and zip code being passed to a group by. And that tells us those have to be tags. 
So here's a potential schema, right? We have a measurement name, pollutants. We have three tags, city, device ID, and zip code. Again, those were all used in group by, so we know they have to be there. And we have the fields, uh, latitude, longitude, smog level, CO2, lead, SO2 level. So this fits with what our queries need. We have the right uh, measurements that are being passed to functions. We have those as, or excuse me, the metrics that are being passed to functions. We have those as fields. Uh, the metrics that are being passed to the metadata that's being passed to group by, we have as tags. And we're storing our high cardinality latitude and longitude as fields. So here's an example of writing those in line protocol. And these uh, are line wrapped for clarity. Um, however, when actually submitting line protocol in the system, you must submit each line on a single line. A new line begins a new point. Uh, so these are only for legibility. Please do not use them directly like this. But we have pollutants is the measurement, and then a comma to let us know that the tag set is coming. Uh, the full tag set would be something like city equals Richmond, device ID equals one, zip code equals whatever it is. And then we have our field set, the latitude, the longitude, the smog, CO2, lead, and SO2. And then finally, our timestamp. And then another example below, a different city, different zip code, different uh, measurements that we're getting back. Uh, and in this case, actually the same timestamp. Now, here's another one that we could do. Um, and this is one where we're actually going to put the latitude and the longitude in as tags. Uh, and again, this could work if we are fairly well bounded in where those latitude and longitude could be. Um, here we are storing degrees, minutes, seconds, but we're not storing uh, anything smaller than seconds. So the cardinality is only a million or so. Uh, I guess it's actually 3.6 million for each of these potentially. Uh, however, it's unlikely that we have a sensor everywhere. And we know that we only have 10,000 sensors. If we only have 10,000 sensors, we only have 10,000 unique latitude longitude levels. That's actually not super terrible. Um, and those latitude and longitude are actually dependent on the device ID tag. The device ID tag for the sensor implies the latitude and longitude of that device. Now, if our devices were moving, if they were attached to garbage trucks around the city, if they were on drones, if they were on blimps, if they were on weather balloons, then it might not work to use this schema because our latitude and longitude would be truly unbounded. But in this case, latitude and longitude are dependent tags on the device ID. And so this could also be a perfectly uh, reasonable schema that we could use. But we lose the numeric properties of our latitude and longitude when we do this. We're storing them as strings now. So that is one thing to be aware of. And again, we have examples in line protocol of writing them out this way. Uh, the only difference being that the latitude and longitude key value pairs have moved from the field set to the tag set. OK. So now that we've looked at how to come to a schema and think about a schema and think about how we need to make our trade-offs for the various columns, should they be a field, should they be a tag, what are the implications of choosing one over the other for this? Then we also need to talk a little bit about what are the hardware requirements uh, in order to run my InfluxDB uh, system. And I would like to preface this before I even go to the next slide by saying these are extremely rough guidelines. Uh, the number of points that you can write per second, the number of series that you can have in a certain amount of RAM, the number of queries that you can execute against the system are extremely dependent on the size of your data, the shape of your data, the types of queries you want to run. Um, you could probably run a few hundred queries per second if they're only sampling the last 10 minutes. You probably can't run more than a few dozen queries per second if they're sampling the last few hours. And if you're going over an entire day and sampling, say, you know, a few million points at a time, uh, those queries are going to take potentially 1,000 milliseconds or more to execute, right? If you're writing in data, and all of your data is a key value pair where the value is a number, that's going to be really fast. If you're writing in data and some of your tags or some of your fields have a value that is a 40K string, that's going to be slower. It just takes longer for the system to churn through a 40 kilobyte field key than it, or field, uh, or field uh, value than it does one that's, say, 5 or 10 bytes. So there's no... On this piece of hardware, you will get this many points per second right throughput. Or on this piece of hardware, you will be able to have this many series. On this piece of hardware, you'll be able to do this many queries per second. It's not possible for us to make completely broad statements like that. But we can talk about, in general, assuming that your data is roughly like other people's data and you don't have any extreme outliers. You're not, you don't have, say, 50 tags per point. Um, you're not storing strings that are, say, more than uh, a few K. Um, you're not using tag keys that are a few kilobytes long, for instance, um, then all of those things will be, then these should be relatively true. Uh, even if you're doing things like writing data uh, across a very wide range of time. So the system assumes and performs best when what you're writing in are timestamps from the recent past. 
uh, the last few hours, maybe the last day. If you're writing in, say, scientific data, and you're suddenly putting in data from 2002 through 2016, then the write performance will be slower as the system has to go out and create all of the files on disk for all of these huge time range versus the time range is just the last week and a half. So all of that is to say that these hardware requirements that we're going to give here are broad overview. They're, they're guidelines. Um, your, by, your mileage will vary, and we can't say exactly how it will vary, but uh, this is a good place to start and to begin your testing. So we have basically what we call uh, three or four load profiles here, right? So a low load profile is less than 25,000 writes per second, um, less than five queries per second, and less than 100,000 unique series. So each of these, and, and we're really, to some extent, talking about each of these independently. If you have uh, 200,000 writes per second, for example, that's a high use case, regardless of what your query load or your RAM load is. You, you'll need a lot of CPU, you'll need a lot of RAM in order to handle 200,000 writes per second. Um, and you know, if, if you only have five queries per second, but you have a million unique series, then you're still going to need a lot of RAM. Even though you're not putting that much of a query load on the system, a high cardinality of series will lead to a lot of RAM needs. Uh, so these, and again, these are very rough, but basically uh, the low, a low use or what we would consider a not, not a very heavy load on the system, less than 25,000 writes per second, less than five queries per second, and less than 100,000 unique series. Um, and let me be clear that we are not talking about points uh, per second, or excuse me, values per second when we talk about that write, we're talking about points per second. Um, so since a, a point can have multiple fields on it, it's possible to have many values per second. But here we're actually really talking mostly about the number of points that you're writing. And a moderate workload for the system, again, something that would be appropriate for a mid-range server. This would be somewhere, you know, more than 25, but less than 200,000 writes a second, maybe a couple of dozen queries per second, and less than a million unique series. Once we get above 200K writes per second, or 25 queries per second, or a million series, then we're into the high use case, the high resource use case. And if you're looking at... Uh, and we can probably update this slide. At this point, if you're looking at more than a million writes a second, um, more than 100 queries per second, or more than 10 million unique series, that's probably not feasible. It may be doable depending on your schema. It may be doable depending on how, uh, how amazing your hardware is. But it's probably going to be at the edges of the performance envelope. And I would like to point out, we mentioned clustering earlier. These numbers here would be per node for the cluster for the most part. Um, so you can actually get a fairly significant amplification of write throughput or query throughput or series cardinality by having multiple data nodes in a single cluster. Um, it's not completely linearly additive, uh, but it is it is additive, uh, definitely. So a million writes a second, 100 queries per second, and 10 million unique series is totally feasible in a cluster. Uh, but again, that is, uh, that is something you need to reach out to us for, for help building. We certainly would advise that. OK, so. Uh, what do we consider to be low, moderate, and high machines for this? So for the low use case, we're basically saying you should have a couple of CPU cores, you should have a couple of gig of RAM, and you need at least 500 IOPS from your storage system. Um, it is possible to run InfluxDB on spinning platter, especially if you have a RAID that's optimized for IOPS. However, it will always be a better experience if you're running it against an SSD. And if you have the moderate or high use case, you need to be running it against an SSD. I'm unaware of any SANS or NAS devices that can top 1,000 IOPS consistently. Uh, that would be a cheaper option than simply putting SSDs in there. So uh, for the low use case, which again, we can look here, right? A, a few thousand writes per second, a handful of queries per second, less than 100,000 unique series. You're going to be totally fine. Two to four CPUs, two to four gig RAM, 500 IOPS. Um, and in fact, we have people who are successfully getting 10,000 writes a second on things like a Raspberry Pi. Uh, so it's entirely doable. Um, you can even run InfluxDB on a system that only has half a gig of RAM. Uh, it's just, you know, you're, you're going you're gonna to run up against resource constraints fairly quickly there, potentially. The moderate use case, we're looking at, say, four to six CPU cores, eight to 32 gig of RAM. Um, and you really probably want to shoot for 1,000 IOPS on the system. Again, any SSD is going to have 15 to 30 times that kind of IOPS. So you're totally fine there. Uh, and then the high use case, you know, again, if we're looking at many hundreds of thousands of writes per second, or we're looking at hundreds of queries per second, or we're looking at millions and millions of series, then we're probably talking about eight or more CPU cores. We're talking about more than 32 gig of RAM. We're talking about definitely needing a thousand IOPS. Now, the nice thing about the system is that the IOPS requirement pegs at about 1200 or so. Um, so unless you are, uh, unless you're doing almost a pathological use case, uh, any SSD on the market will handle the IOPS load just fine. Um, 
it is possible to, to continue throwing cores and RAM at the box as your needs grow, uh, but there's not really a way to throw more IOPS at it. It doesn't, it doesn't help the performance once we get beyond about 2000 IOPS. Uh, and for the 10 million series use case, that 30 gig of RAM, 32 plus would be something like 128 gig of RAM, for instance. Uh, and like I said, those numbers should be uh, reducible towards the end of this year. Um, but you will always want to have a lot of RAM if you have a high number of series, simply because uh, the system will have to keep a very large index and a lot of points in the, in the in RAM at one time in order to serve queries that that reach across many of those series. So some general performance tips when thinking about uh, what you want to what you want to spec for your server or where you want to start. Uh, InfluxDB is CPU heavy. Um, we generally test and we run on the C3 series on AWS, which are the compute intensive. Um, memory usage is most heavily correlated with the number of unique series in the database. So the number one driver of your RAM needs, your kind of passive RAM needs, if you will, right? Um, if we have an InfluxDB system receiving no writes and no queries, but it has a million series in it, when that system starts up, it has to load that index into RAM. It will have, it will chew up something like say 40 gig of RAM just as a static need. Um, with no other load on the system whatsoever. Um, so obviously, as we mentioned in the third point here, high query loads require a lot of memory, uh, which makes sense. We're keeping a lot of things in RAM as we as the system uh, performs functions on them or sorts them or groups them uh, and then bundles them up and returns them as JSON. So uh, lots of queries means more RAM. You just simply need more scratch space for those calculations to take place. But the number one driver of the passive memory need uh, and the number one play that people get themselves into trouble with RAM needs is the number of unique series in the database. Um, and in our documentation, we give some queries on how to determine how many series you have in your database right now. Uh, and that can be scoped per database. It cannot be scoped any lower than per database right now. We're working on some tools to allow us to identify uh, series per measurement uh, trivially. Um, it is possible to somewhat determine that using the database and a sort uh, and count um, in the, in a post-processing client side um, and you know ask us about that we can help you with that uh, and so high query loads will require additional memory for that scratch space and remember run InfluxDB on SSDs uh, again it will work on spinning platter but it will have a radically different performance uh, characteristics and it will have significantly reduced throughput both for queries and for uh, writes so how much disk are you going to need, right? You got to buy an SSD. That's cool. SSDs aren't cheap. You don't want to go out and buy the biggest thing you possibly can. Uh, how would you capacity plan for how much data you'll need? So non-string fields, so fields that are stored as uh, integers, floating point, or Booleans, take about three bytes per point. And this should actually say per field. Um, I'll fix that. So three bytes per field, which means that if you're storing a billion points of one field each, that's about three gig on disk. In a lot of my testing, it actually works out to be more like 2.3, 2.4. Uh, but we want to be a little bit conservative, a little bit pessimistic, and say when you're estimating how much space you'll need for every numeric field stored, for every Boolean field stored, allocate three gigabytes on disk. Excuse me, <laughs> three bytes on disk. String values that are being stored, obviously, uh, we cannot predict in advance what the compression will be. Oops. Sorry about that. Uh, so the string values will have will, will require whatever they require uh, as a result of the compression from the golang libraries um, you can predict that somewhat by running them through the go compression library and seeing what they do uh, but you know you can also predict that simply by looking at the string and making some guesses as to how compressible it is and multiplying that by how many of those strings you have um, now one thing that's not mentioned on this slide that i do want to point out uh, measurement names and the full tag set so the tag value and the tag uh, key those are only stored once in the system, regardless of how many points are written to the series. So they do not have any significant impact on the storage needs of the system, right? Even if I submit a billion points with a tag that has a 40 kilobyte uh, value, so I have some incredibly long, let's say for whatever reason, I just have an incredibly long host name, um, then that's only going to incur that storage penalty once in the system. Really, it's once per shard, but you know it, it's it's not very much at all. Uh, so we don't need to consider that a significant driver of use. Um, only the fields are stored per point. The tags, the full tag uh, key value pair, and the measurement name are stored once per series. So your storage needs are driven by how many fields you have. And if those fields are numeric or Boolean, they will take three bytes on disk. If those fields are strings, they will take whatever they take when they're compressed. 
Now, when this is initially written to disk, the storage needs will be higher. The storage files, uh, the storage uh, system that we use, uh, it's a, a format that we wrote ourselves uh, called the TSM uh, engine format. TSM stores, pi stores points initially in a very sparse format. And then as those points age and as the write and query load against them reduces, as they become further in the past and therefore less interesting or less frequently accessed, and then as they are no longer part of the currently hot shard, the place that new data is being written to, the system performs a series of compactions against that data. So the three bytes per field is the fully compacted result. So when you're initially slamming data into the database, you'll see a higher data usage. After a week or two and, and you're continuing to write data and that older data has had a chance to age out and become fully compacted, that's when you'll see the three bytes per disk, or excuse me, the three bytes per, per field. So at that point, we are now uh, to the questions. And I will stop sharing my screen and drop into the uh, Q&A with Gunnar to answer any questions that you might have.